I now call on Fergus Ewing to speak to move the motion. Mr Ewing, you have 10 minutes, and I note that the Labour front bench spokesperson is not here. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to open the debate on the general principles of the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. I thank those who gave uh, evidence, both written and in person, and the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the Bill at Stage 1. In particular, I, I welcome the latter's support for the Bill's general principles. As many of you will be aware, this is the very first Bill to have been considered under the new Scottish Law Commission Bill procedure, and I wish to comment on that. When the Parliament decided in May last year, presiding officer, to accept recommendations for changes to the standing orders to allow certain Scottish Law Commission bills to be referred to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, they recognised the valuable role of the Commission in reforming the law of Scotland. It was also intended that the new process would go some way towards increasing the implementation rate of Commission reports. In my view, the process is working very well. I have been impressed with the way in which the committee has taken on their new role, and I hope this will be the first of many bills to be considered in this way. I note the committee's recommendation in their Stage 1 report that the Scottish Government take steps in order to ensure appropriate research has been undertaken to provide statistical evidence to the committee in connection with Scottish Law Commission bills in future. The committee have my response to the Stage 1 report. The Scottish Government has a key objective of sustainable economic growth and business competitiveness. We want to ensure that Scotland is an attractive place for business. The reforms contained in the Legal Writings Bill, whilst modest and technical, uh, will, but not in an insignificant fashion, promote business and economic growth and modernise Scots law. The bill does two main things. First, it enables documents to be executed in counterpart. This puts beyond any doubt that this is permissible in Scots law, a matter about which there is currently great uncertainty, and will give the legal profession and the business interests they represent the necessary confidence to use Scots law for these sorts of transactions. Second, it makes provision for the facility to deliver, that's deliver in the legal sense, presenting officer, traditional documents electronically. So, any document created on paper may become legally effective by being delivered by electronic means, such as email or fax. I was very pleased to note that the committee supports the general principles of the bill, and in particular, these two key provisions. The provisions have the potential to help those involved in complex transactions where parties and their legal advisors can be in different countries uh, or even in different continents, and meeting together may be impossible or highly impracticable. But they also have the potential to help anyone in Scotland conducting a transaction which involves a number of parties who are unable as a practical matter to get together, for example, where parties live in remote rural or island areas. For the avoidance of doubt, the consequence of the present uncertainty in this area is that practitioners sometimes choose not to use Scots law to govern the document. There is a consistent view that this is common. It happens regularly and may happen at the outset of a transaction or just before the transaction is finalised. We are not just talking about multinational and multi-jurisdictional transactions, but also transactions which are entirely Scottish in their makeup and which, for want of any clarity about the use of execution in counterpart, the decision is made to use another law. Where Scots law is not used, this will often have the knock-on effect of any consequential litigation not being conducted in Scotland. The committee recognised that the current uncertainty as to whether execution and counterpart is competent under Scots law appears to have led to a drift away from transactions being concluded under Scots law with parties opting to conclude under the law of a different jurisdiction, for example, English law, where the execution and counterpart is recognised. A number of people giving evidence to the committee have uh, described the bill as being capable of addressing this drift. A clear benefit of the bill will be that in circumstances where Scots law should have been used, but uh, because of doubt over the legality of executing and counterpart it is not used, parties will now have the confidence to use Scots law. 
Scots law requires some documents to be delivered in order to take full legal effect. In the same way as doubt exists around whether execution and counterpart is valid under Scots law, there are also conflicting authorities on whether a paper document may be legally delivered by its electronic transmission to the grantee or a third party such as a solicitor or agent for one of the parties. This question has arisen from the 1990s onwards, mainly in respect of purported delivery of documents relating to land by way of fax. One of the principal aims of the bill is to resolve this uncertainty, in particular, but not only, as it impacts on transactions completed by way of execution and counterpart. It does so by saying that delivery of a copy of a paper document or a copy of part of that document by electronic means constitutes delivery. Beyond that, it does not attempt to alter the law on delivery. During the Stage 1 evidence sessions, the Faculty of Advocates did level some criticisms towards the Bill. The Faculty's concerns were around increased potential for fraud and, more likely in their view, error associated with execution and counterpart, particularly if, as the Bill allows, only the signature pages of the documents are exchanged between parties as part of that process. We uh, have considered these concerns very thoroughly and have uh, concluded that the bill will do nothing to increase the prospects of fraud or error as a result of executing in counterpart and exchanging only the signature pages of the document. This view was shared by other Stage 1 witnesses. The committee note that the majority of those giving evidence at Stage 1 expressed the general view that fraud and error would always occur to an extent and that the bill was unlikely to lead to an increase in either fraud or error. The committee, presiding officer, were particularly thorough in their examination of this issue, and I note that they are not persuaded that the bill will lead to any increase in instances of fraud and error. In summary, presiding officer, this is a small but important bill which will provide certainty in relation to execution and counterpart and electronic delivery of traditional documents in Scots law. Importantly, the approach of the legislation has been to ensure that it is permissive and as flexible as possible. Inherent in that flexibility is the ability of the parties to a transaction to set out how the process will work for them. The bill has been very warmly welcomed by the majority of the legal profession and there has been some very positive and encouraging articles about the bill in the press and in other publications. I firmly believe that the bill creates a light touch yet helpful framework for a variety of transactions. We are in the Scottish Government confident that it will meet a clear and pressing demand from those likely to be affected by the bill and uh, we would not wish to overestimate the value in bringing clarity, flexibility and certainty to the law. I move, therefore, that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Legal Writings, Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Nigel Dawn to speak on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Around seven minutes or so, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I do genuinely welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee on the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. This bill, of course, is of particular significance as it is the first to be known as a Scottish Law Commission Bill. This follows changes to standing orders last year, which provided that certain Scottish Law Commission bills may be referred to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. <coughs> I should start by saying the Scottish Law Commission plays a vital role in recommending reforms aimed at updating and improving Scots law. However, until recently, the implementation rate of the Commission's proposed bills has been low. A new process, which we are undertaking for the first time, will allow these bills to be given the consideration they deserve and for important reforms to be implemented. I would at this stage, presiding officer, just like to pay tribute and, and give my thanks to the parliamentary staff who a couple of years ago did the background work which considered whether or not we should be changing our standing orders 
Um, and I'd also like to pay tribute to Christine Graham, MSP, who of course is the Justice Committee's convener, and Bruce Crawford, who was the uh, government minister uh, responsible at the time for providing the political impetus which actually enabled us to change the standing orders in order to make sure that these bills do come forward. We must do what we can to ensure that Scottish law is up to date and competitive. Through the passage of the bill so far, it has been as interest much interesting to see what other jurisdictions have been making of this process. I believe some of them may even be envious of the process that we now have in the Scottish Parliament. Turning to the bill itself, I'd firstly like to thank all those who provided written and oral evidence. In addition to the written submissions, we heard from the legal, business and academic representatives over five oral sessions. The detailed evidence received was greatly appreciated by the committee. As the Minister has said, the bill has two key provisions, that execution in counterpart should be clarified as a valid process in Scots law, and that paper legal documents should be deliverable, in the legal sense of the word, by electronic means. Execution in counterpart is the process by which documents can be given legal effect by each party signing separate but identical copies of the document rather than the same single physical document. The bill seeks to remove the current uncertainty as to whether this is a valid way of creating legally effective documents in Scots law. In providing for the delivery of paper legal documents by electronic means, the bill aims to resolve any doubt as to whether a document is legally effective if it has been faxed or emailed rather than delivered by traditional means. Evidence to the committee suggested there is a widespread support for these provisions amongst the legal business and academic sectors. The current system for signing contracts under Scots law is generally considered to be inefficient and burdensome with parties having to go to great lengths to ensure that one single document is signed by them all. To achieve this, they have to organise signing ceremonies where each party is required to gather at an agreed place at an agreed time in order to sign a single document. Alternatively, of course, the document is sent to each party sequentially for, for each signature to be attached one by one. By making clear that documents may be executing counterpart under Scots law and by allowing for traditional documents to be delivered electronically, the need for such procedures is completely removed. It therefore follows that the process of agreeing a contract may be much more efficient and straightforward as each party can simply sign their own copy before delivering it to the others. In the committee's view, one of the main benefits of the bill is its potential to increase the number of contracts carried out under Scots law. The committee heard that the perceived inability to execute documents in counterpart often leads parties who would otherwise have drawn up their contracts under Scots law to state within the document that it will be governed by another legal system, such as the English legal system, allowing them to avoid processes such as the aforementioned signing ceremony. Many witnesses argued, therefore, that, that by providing for execution in counterpart, the bill could lead to an increase in contracts contracted under Scots law. However, we should not get carried away about this. The bill is unlikely to bring an influx of contracts to Scotland from those who would otherwise have no reason to use Scots law. Parties choose which law will govern their contract for a variety of reasons. And the committee also heard that English and New York law are dominant internationally and will in all likelihood continue to be so. For some, however, the inability to execute a document in counterpart is the determining factor behind their choice of law. The committee heard examples of contracts which have been switched to English law at the 11th hour as it became apparent that all parties would be unable to gather together in order to sign a single document. It therefore, could therefore be argued that by allowing for execution in counterpart, the bill will encourage such parties to use Scots law rather than switch to another form of law. The committee therefore considers that the bill has the potential to stop the drift of contracts away from Scots law, which would otherwise have been made under our law. In addition to assessing the potential benefits of the bill, the committee considered its potential challenges. In its evidence to the committee, the Faculty of Advocates suggested the bill's provisions could potentially lead to an increase in instances of fraud or error. The faculty was particularly concerned that the bill allows parties to exchange signature pages as opposed to hold documents. It considered that this would increase the likelihood that the content of the document could be altered. The faculty's view was not, however, shared by other witnesses. Having considered all the evidence, the committee was not persuaded that the bill would lead to an increase in either fraud or error, 
In reaching this conclusion, the committee took account of the lack of evidence of instances of fraud or error in other countries in which execution in counterpart and in electronic delivery of documents is already commonly practiced. Further to this, the committee noted the existing safeguards which are in place in our law to both prevent and to deal with both fraud and error. At the same time, the committee encourages the Scottish Government to continue to ensure that the potential for fraud and error is accounted for and to consider how such risks could be reduced further. The committee therefore recommends the general principles of the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill be agreed to. Thus far, the new system for implementing Scottish Law Commission bills appears to be working well, and I agree with the, the uh, Minister on that, and I'm grateful for his comments. I look forward to the continued process of the bill and to scrutinising further bills under this welcome process. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Mitchell. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this afternoon's debate on the Legal Writings Bill and thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and its clerks, together with the witnesses and those who submitted evidence during the consultation process, for their contributions and scrutiny of the bill. Presiding officer, I'd be surprised if there were not support for this legislation from everyone in the chamber this evening. It certainly has the support of the Scottish Conservatives for this is legislation which seeks to improve contract law by making some important changes to the way that legal documents can be signed and brought into legal effect in Scotland. In doing so, as the Minister stated, it focuses on counterparts, that is, the signing of identical copies of documents, the counterparts, rather than the same physical document and also on electronic delivery of scanned documents. At present, as previous contributors to the consultation made clear, there is considerable uncertainty as to whether or not documents can be executed in counterpart under Scots law, despite this being deemed more efficient. This is because the current preference of legal practitioners, depending on the type of transaction, is to follow the often time-consuming and cumbersome practices of either a signing ceremony or, alternatively, the, the round-robin process, which ensures that the same document is signed by all the parties involved. In addition, both of these options can at times be excessively costly, inefficient and impractical, particularly if the transaction is multi-jurisdictional in nature and the relevant parties are separated by different locations. Location is a key issue in our increasingly globalised society. This was highlighted in the Weir Group's written submission, which stated that 90% of that company's contracts involve multiple parties and locations. Furthermore, the Bill's provisions, crucially, bring Scots law into step with other legal systems and modernises out-of-date processes that have caused delays and ambiguity. For example, in England and other jurisdictions such as New Zealand, Australia and America, legal documents can be executed, that is, brought into legal effect, if signed in counterpart. The University of Glasgow's Dr Ross Anderson made a very perceptive comment when he remarked that it is crucial that Scotland stops exporting transactions that are carried out by the ordinary people of Scotland and by Scottish businesses and companies and which relates to assets in Scotland. This underscores the pressing need for change. It is, after all, unacceptable that we cannot persuade our own citizenry to use our law, which, as Dr Anderson further comments, reflects poorly on its content. With this in mind, the Bill's proposed changes are extremely positive for the development and application of Scots law for legal practitioners 
and for those who seek to use it. However, as Robert Howey QC emphasised during his evidence to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, it is important to manage expectations and to understand that this legislation is not presented as a panacea that will then automatically lead to an increase in contracts made under Scots law. And this was a point re-emphasised by Nigel Don in his contribution today. In particular, in commercial and other transactions, it is often the legal jurisdiction rather than the associated processes which takes precedence. In many cases, New York and English law are likely to continue to be widely used. This is recognised in the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's Stage 1 report, which assesses that the Bill will put Scotland in a more equitable position with other jurisdictions, rather than emphasising a potential competitive advantage over other jurisdictions. It is also fair to say that while the legal community was generally supportive of the Bill's provision, there was some criticism. Both the Faculty of Advocates and the law firm Freshfields, Brookhouse and Derringer have pointed to several drafting issues which may merit further consideration at Stage 2. The Faculty also expressed concerns that with the Bill's proposed changes, parties may execute different versions of the documents in question, either due to error or fraud. Although other witnesses suggested that this was a moot point and that fraud can already occur under the present arrangements, it is important to bear this possibility, however remote in mind, and to ensure that sufficient safeguards are in place as the Bill moves to the next stage. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Bill will have a positive impact on Scots law and will help ensure that those individuals and businesses seeking to undertake transactions in this jurisdiction do not experience obstacles or delays. I therefore confirm again that the Legal Writings Bill and this Stage 1 report has the Scottish Conservatives' support. Many thanks. And I call on Jenny Mara, around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by apologising to yourself, Presiding Officer, to the Minister and to uh, members for my late arrival in the Chamber this afternoon. I am pleased to open the Stage 1 debate for Labour today and I welcome the general principles like the other parties of the Legal Writings Bill because it is important for our businesses here in Scotland. Firstly, there has been confusion to date about whether execution in counterpart is legally binding in Scotland. And I think that's one of the most important parts of this bill because it clarifies that signing in counterpart is a valid way of executing a contract in Scotland under Scots law. I think that's one of the most important parts of the bill. I would also commend the second key element of the bill, which states that paper legal documents should be deliverable by electronic means, including by email and fax. Now, the increase in efficiency and flexibility which these will provide for make it easier for businesses to contract in Scotland under Scots law. And that is the key thing about this bill. It's encouraging to see that the bill largely follows the Scottish Law Commission's recommendations, which outline that the current law is not serving the needs of businesses in a modern electronic age, since it has been more difficult for parties who are in different locations to enter into commercial transactions. And I'm sure the law firms will be uh, very pleased to see that their taxi bills of sending their young trainees off with contracts from offices to offices will be significantly reduced by this bill. Presiding officer, even though this bill could be viewed as an inevitable technical change to how a contract is concluded, I think it's crucial to note that today's debate brings to the fore a matter 
that is far more significant. It signifies a moment of modernisation, a moment that we can grasp and use to enter a new phase of digital progression and business innovation. Firstly, let us look at the aspect of the bill which allows contracts to be signed in counterpart. This means that the parties involved do not have to be in the same location at the same time to sign the contract. Simply, counterparts of that document need to be supplied and delivered appropriately. Though the ability to do this existed before, its clarification and reinforcement through this bill makes forming contracts and thus doing business much easier. And it stops businesses, as the uh, Conservative spokesperson and the Minister said, from changing into English law at the last minute, a thing that none of us uh, want to see uh, for businesses in Scotland. And this was increasingly common uh, when all parties could not be present in the same location at the time of signing. Now, this will bring Scots law into line with many other international jurisdictions, as Margaret Mitchell said, including England and New York, as the two biggest legal centres in the world. And the crucial thing about this is that they do more business than anywhere else. So this bill makes it more attractive to do business in Scotland. In a submission to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, Dixon Minto outlined that the bill becoming law would present um, an immeasurable improvement to the process of execution of documents in Scotland. They said that the bill will provide greater flexibility to businesses and improve the speed at which transactions are completed. Thus, not only does signing contracts using counterparts increase efficiency, it makes it easier to form, deliver and execute contracts in Scots law. Now, the second part of the bill addresses electronic signatures. This improves the efficiency of the contractual process and makes the important signing of the document the centre of the process, dispensing with matters such as location, calendars, travel, accommodation costs and so on. Digital modernisation is key for Scotland and it's a matter that we've discussed many times in this chamber. And we can see why when we look to countries like Estonia. Estonia is now widely recognised as one of the most tech savvy nations in the world, presiding officer. They made innovation policy a political priority and paired it with initiatives such as giving its population free access to Wi-Fi. Similarly, in Finland, recovery from its deep depression of the early 1990s was achieved by putting technology innovation at the heart of its response, maintaining spend on technology in the face of wider cuts. Now, the Legal Writings Bill paves the way for time and cost savings for those entering into a contract in Scotland, be it a business providing services to another business or to an individual buying a house. An interesting uh, innovation which the Law Society of Scotland has been working on illustrates the legal world's keenness to embrace what the Legal Writings Bill outlines. This is a smart card secure scheme which registers a secure digital signature, which then allows practising solicitors to sign documents and contracts entirely electronically and to receive signatures from others knowing they came from a trusted professional system. Presiding officer, an increasing number of solicitors are registering to this scheme, which aims to have completed its rollout by November next year. Now, this scheme, along with the proposals brought forward in this bill, allow us to go forward with confidence in avoiding fraud and error as much as possible. As well as making business easier, I think there are numerous benefits that this bill brings, and I hope together that we can build on them with the consensus across the Chamber. Labour is pleased to support the principles of this bill at Stage 1, Presiding Officer, and we look forward to its passage through Parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of around seven minutes, please. There is time in hand. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Thank you very much, President Officer. You're so generous with the time. Um, it's, uh, I, first of all, I do want to add my thanks to those of uh, the convener, Nairo Dawn, uh, regarding the assistance uh, that our committee actually received when we went through the, the, this, uh, through the scrutiny of this bill. 
Uh, the bill, as we've heard, is a first for the Parliament, uh, and it's actually been an interesting. It's been very interesting actually going through this particular process. Now there haven't, uh, there hasn't been as uh, many time constraints uh, placed upon it, uh, which I believe actually in this instance is probably of great benefit. But I'm sure that uh, that when more bills from the Scottish Law Commission go through the delegated powers and law reform committee, then the timescales involved will, uh, will reduce uh, rather slightly or greatly. Uh, the bill has been non-contentious, uh, but uh, there obviously, as with any bill, uh, there have been parts in which uh, have had some conflicting evidence. And the evidence that we received from the Faculty of Advocates, in particular, as we've already heard, uh, that certainly seemed to be at odds uh, from other interested parties. Now, this has been, uh, it's been helpful, and it certainly did uh, manage to provide uh, an opportunity for some further debate uh, within the committee as we went through the process. Uh, and it certainly aided uh, when we had our, uh, our private discussions in terms of putting the report together. It certainly aided that particular part of the process too. Uh, but also, it actually allowed us the chance to uh, have a kind of question the bill a bit more and also its stated aims. But I do, however, believe that the bill uh, will be a welcome addition to business in Scotland. Uh, we heard from a number of people uh, giving evidence that, uh, that some business transactions end up taking place under different jurisdictions, predominantly that uh, of under English law, uh, and also sometimes from New York uh, law. Uh, Scotland has lost business as a consequence of a system that didn't actually provide flexibility. Uh, and this bill, although it's, this bill is not going to change the world, but what the bill will do, it's actually, it, it's aims, it does aim to actually rectify that by making this part of Scots law more flexible and competitive, then uh, more business can actually take place within Scotland. At the very least, uh, the bill will actually make it easier and cheaper for transactions to take place under Scots law, uh, which is something I'm sure that, uh, that we all welcome. Uh, and as a committee, we actually weren't sure uh, how much additional business uh, will be retained in Scotland, but uh, we all believe that uh, it clearly will happen, which uh, will result in an economic benefit. And certainly will also aid, uh, certainly aid businesses uh, within the country. In paragraphs 158 to 174 uh, of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee report, we discussed the issue of uh, an electronic repository. Now, this was an area that, uh, that, that first came to my attention uh, a couple of years ago uh, when I was a member of the EET committee, and we were actually scrutinising the, the land registration bill at the time. And the concept of an electronic repository you know, to store independently legal documents did receive some attention uh, then and also... Uh, certainly through this particular bill. Uh, and as a committee, we took the view that, uh, that we supported the concept uh, and uh, for it to be maintained by the registers of Scotland. That element of being an independent body uh, maintaining uh, this register was something that was very, very important uh, when we actually had, uh, had these discussions. We certainly considered uh, that this particular, uh, an electronic repository to be a useful tool to store records of contracts. We also thought that uh, it could also be a means of uh, executing documents by way of electronic signature, and certainly that was an issue that my colleague Stuart Stevenson, uh, he was very keen to, to highlight uh, on a regular basis when we went through the, the scrutiny of the bill. But uh, we were also minded, however, that, uh, that two main issues required to be addressed. And the first one uh, being that of uh, sufficient safeguards. Uh, they needed to be in place uh, to ensure the scrutiny, well, to ensure security, sorry. In the fast-moving pace of uh, IT, uh, software development, uh, this uh, could be a challenge, but it's actually not one that's insurmountable. And the second point and that, we, that we thought really was, uh, was crucial in this was uh, that the committee took the view that uh, if a repository is to be created, then there really shouldn't be an obligation for parties to actually use it. It should actually be their choice. Uh, well, when we did hear in evidence of examples where, uh, where a firm or firms may cease trading and uh, documents that they actually had and may no longer be available. Um, we've already had, heard today in terms of, um, in the past, maybe some, uh, some activities that have taken place that haven't been uh, uh, thoroughly legal, to say the least. But, uh, but we certainly were very much aware uh, that uh, this was something very much in a, just a small number of cases. But it actually could create large problems. This certainly was one of the strongest supporting comments actually for having a central repository. Uh, the bill is an important piece of the jigsaw. In, in facilitation, but it's also it's an important piece of the jigsaw in facilitating a more modern business legal system, uh, and it, uh, it, it aids uh, with the Scottish Government's digital uh, economy policies. 
the Scottish business transactions will be more efficient and the, there will also be a more positive environmental impact as business representatives will no longer need to travel all over the world uh, just to sign some particular contracts. Uh, I certainly welcome the bill uh, and also I'm, I'm certainly sure that it will have a positive impact uh, upon the, certainly the legal side of things but also upon business in Scotland and if we can actually do that then there will be a better and a, a better economic return and certainly a more prosperous Scotland can actually come from that. So I certainly welcome the general principles of the bill. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. This is the first time that a recommendation of the Scottish Law Commission has been taken forward in this way, with a bill being brought to Parliament by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The bill the Committee has asked in Parliament to consider is one that my Labour co colleagues and I are inclined to support at Stage 1. Not only do I believe that the general principles of this bill are sound, but I also believe that the work of both the Scottish Law Commission and the Committee demonstrates that there is a very clear need to modernise our contract law in Scotland. In supporting this bill, I hope that Parliament can give clarity, as asked before, in concepts of counterparts and delivery, bring about a legal framework for contracts that reflect changes in technology and business practice, and I also hope we make some wider contribution to the Scottish economy. I would congratulate the Scottish Law Commission for their work in this bill. They have undertaken an informed and extensive consultation. Their work has highlighted the need for a new bill and demonstrated that there is support for reform across the legal, academic and business communities. In their work, the Scottish Law Commission identified two problems with commercial and contract law in Scotland, which they believe could be dealt with through this Parliament's new approach to law reform. They highlighted the need for clarity in respect of counterparts. It was not clear whether a legal document can be brought into effect if it is signed in counterpart. In other words, the Commission were not clear whether it is acceptable under Scots law for different parties to sign identical copies of a contract instead of signing the same physical copy of the document. Secondly, they call for clarity in respect of the law on delivery. It is not clear whether a paper document, such as a traditional written contract, can be said to have been delivered if it is sent and delivered electronically. The view of the Commission is that the current law is not fit for purpose because the letter of our law in Scotland is at variance with a common practice and also with contract law in neighbouring jurisdictions. The Commission even found evidence that businesses are sometimes choosing to use English law to govern agreements instead of Scottish law because counterparts are permitted under English law. This disincentive to using Scots law coupled with legal uncertainty over methods of delivery may well be doing harm to our economic competitiveness. By allowing the use of counterpart signatures as an option to execute a contract and by allowing contracts to be delivered electronically, we could help businesses make time, saving, make time cost savings and reduce travel and accommodation costs. Bear in mind that there will be a limited number of people within a business who are authorised to sign legal documents on behalf of their company. I would also emphasise that the costs to businesses outlined by the Commission are costs they would not face in jurisdictions where contract law has already been modernised and where laws take sufficient account of technological change. Presiding officer, just as we want to be clear of what, what about this bill does do to modernise our laws in respect of counterparts and delivery, let's also be clear about what it doesn't do. It doesn't mandate the use of electronic signatures. It doesn't change the law on fraud. In both civil and criminal law, the existing rules on fraudulent signatures will remain in place. It doesn't change the standard of proof required in relation to execution. The general rules on whether a person claiming to have signed a document has actually done so remains the same as before. It does not alter general contract law. Issues such as whether a contract has been formed, the rules in breach of contract, damages and so forth are not affected by this bill. It does not create an electronic resp uh, repository for legal documents, although this was a recommendation of the Scottish Law Commission. It is an area of work the Scottish Government are keen to pursue once the bill has passed. 
The bill simply brings the law up to date. It allows for contracts to be signed in counterpart, as is acceptable in other jurisdictions, and it allows for paper contracts to be delivered electronically. Presiding officer, with this bill, we have an opportunity to remove a disincentive to conducting businesses in Scots law and to make it easier for parties to enter into commercial contracts and transactions with small but significant changes which are largely uncontroversial, we can bring contract law up to date and make it fit for purpose. It is for this reason that I intend to support the general principles of this Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Mike McKenzie to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I am very pleased to have the opportunity of speaking in this debate because the work of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is seldom properly recognised. It is unlike any of the other committees of the Parliament because it does not deal with policy. And as a consequence, less visitors attend the public sessions and even, or very few visitors attend the public sessions and even fewer journalists perhaps a bit like today in the chamber. And we members, therefore, are perhaps the least scrutinised of the scrutinisers in this parliament. <laughs> and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, as it's now known, still mainly deals with subordinate legislation. And that's where our legislative teeth are often found, rather than on the face of the bill, certainly. John Mason. I mean, I do feel for the uh, uh, committee and uh, its lack of uh, interest, perhaps, for the public, but does he feel that's not just inevitable and that uh, perhaps some of the most valuable work in this parliament is done that's not the most uh, seen by the public and the most exciting? Mike McKenzie. I, I absolutely agree with Mr Mason, and indeed that is the point that I was hoping to make whilst I have the opportunity of speaking about the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee this afternoon. So the legislative teeth of, are often found buried in the subordinate legislation rather than on the face of the bill, although it's on the face of the bill that they're most often looked for. And it's sometimes thought to be a dry committee dealing with a dry subject. But I've found it otherwise. I've found it that its focus, its clarity of thought, and its discipline are both demanding and instructive. And I've found that the words in, a, in our SSIs are words often of real power, words weighed by the committee with an almost poetic search for intent and for purpose. Indeed, I've sometimes said in the committee that it reminds me of a remark attributed to Oscar Wilde, who said that I worked very hard on my latest poem today. In the morning, I took a comma out, and in the afternoon, I put it back in again. And I've found that our deliberations on appropriate levels and forms of scrutiny, on clarity of meaning, on the width and the breadth of powers, to be at times almost philosophical in nature. And the language of our law, despite the best intentions of generations of lawyers, is much more than the language of mere mathematics, because it often goes beyond logic, and it's capable of carrying both objective and subjective meaning. And that's where it seems to me often lies the challenge and the interest of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. We filter our legislation through the finest of sieves. It was therefore interesting, President Officer, to see this committee's approach to its first piece of primary legislation, the Legal Writings Bill. And I should pause at this point, and pay tribute to our clerks and to our legal advisers. They brought the same disciplined and painstaking approach to bear 
as they do in all of our work. And I must commend them, not just for their grasp of the law, not just for their impeccable skills of reasoning, but also for that most important ability, the ability to explain their thoughts in plain terms for us, the laypersons who, in the main, make up the committee. Certainly. Nigel Dawn. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm wondering, I'm pretty much enjoying the, the member's contribution. I'm grateful that he's bring, heaping praise on those who do the, much of the work for us. I'm wondering whether he shares the same enthusiasm for the work of the Scottish Law Commission, who, as I remember, came along and gave us a remarkably precise and careful description of what was all involved, complete with drawings, which I still remember, and which seemed to me to be exactly the way to describe law. Right, Mackenzie. I certainly am very happy to agree with the point that Nigel Don makes. And, and in fact, I note that the Scottish Government have said that due to the, 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 the work and the consultation work that the Scottish Law Commission did, it's not really necessary for government to have a further consultation. I think that's the, the hallmark and the stamp of approval on the work of the Scottish Law Commission, particularly uh, as it's approached this bill. So, you know, I ought to perhaps say a few words about the bill itself. And by, <laughs> <laughs> although I see I'm beginning to run out of time. <laughs> by facilitating the execution in counterpart and the electronic transmission of documents, the Legal Writings Bill quite simply brings this aspect of Scots law up to date. And in the year 2014, that part of our law, which is within the scope of this bill, will once again become fit for purpose. And the merits of the bill, presiding officer, are self-evident. They are obvious. The committee were unanimous on this, as were almost all of our witnesses. Only the faculty of advocates perplexed us, perplexed us maintaining that the bill will give rise to an increase in fraud. We were perplexed only insofar as we made a genuine attempt, I think, to understand this argument. In the end, we were not persuaded. The bill, it seems to us, neither adds to nor removes the possibility of fraud. But this is not a bill of grand and sweeping intent. It's not radical. It's not controversial. It's perhaps even not all that exciting. But I commend it to the Chamber because modest improvements are often worthwhile and often important. Many thanks. I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Richard Baker. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think uh, Mike McKenzie has been grossly unfair to the committee. I mean, only this morning we had a piece of secondary legislation on food and the table in the schedule to that particular legislation told me, correctly as it turned out, uh, that corned beef must have 120% meat in it. And the figure was correct. But I'll let you go and read the order for yourself. It will be going to the policy committee shortly. And the figure is correct. So I would never have known that if I wasn't on the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I will indeed. John Mason. How can it be 120%? No, 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 this is not the place. You've got to go and read the relevant piece of, and I can tell you it's on page seven, and the explanation is in a small print, six point print on page 10 if you can understand it when you get there. But believe me, it's interesting. But the point is, we, we, we deal with the minutiae. And the minutiae around contracts is often actually minutiae with very profound effects for our business and for uh, life in Scotland uh, and beyond. Uh, I myself uh, have been involved over the years in uh, dealing with a number of contracts. I had a quick jot down and I found 10 jurisdictions uh, ranging from Delaware to Norway uh, where I've signed contracts. Um, I have only been in San Francisco once in my life and that was simply for the reason uh, to sign a contract. I was in the United States for a grand total of 14 hours and I slept for 10 of them. Uh, because it was overnight. Uh, a friend of mine got up in the morning, got the plane down to Heathrow, got on uh, uh, Concord, 
met somebody airside at uh, Kennedy Airport, signed a contract, got back on the same Concorde, flew back to Heathrow, got the plane back to Edinburgh and was actually home an hour earlier uh, than usual. But what a waste of time and effort to go all that way to sign a contract. So this modest little bill will have profound and useful if effects. Now, uh, Jenny Mara said Estonia. Of course, I'm surprised she didn't name check Skype, uh, which comes from Estonia and was written by software engineers there, a country uh, with some considerable uh, things to offer uh, in the electronic world. Electronic signatures and electronic repositories are going to be something which this will move us a little bit towards. The Law Society is uh, producing its electronic card that will be out to everybody in about a year. But it remains the case that that card, of course, is shared among people in a firm. So there isn't individual certainty about who may have used a card to sign something electronically uh, in that context. So while this bill takes it forward, has uh, emphasis on electronic signatures, it doesn't take it uh, all the way. Now, electronic you. signatures... Yes, I will. Mike McKenzie. I thank the member for uh, taking an intervention. Does he agree with me that the Scottish Government is due um, praise for implementing across the Highlands and Islands the, um, the backbone for a fibre optic uh, broadband system that will facilitate and allow this kind of uh, technological improvement in our law to take place? But does he also agree with me that more work is required to be done on the part of the UK Government in rolling out 2G, 3G and 4G across the Highlands and Islands and also the rural parts of Scotland. Stuart Stevenson, I can give you an extra minute or two on to your seven minutes to make up for the interventions. Uh, that would be very helpful, Presiding Officer, although I have to say I might need about an hour to deal with the scope of that particular intervention. I do note, however, the Irish Government this very day has committed itself to delivering 30 megabit broadband to every single location uh, in Ireland. So perhaps, you know, we've got a little bit uh, to travel uh, 2G, 3G, 4G. I'd welcome any G at home. I currently have none. Uh, so, yes, it's very important. However, to return to the subject of the bill, which I'm sure, presiding officer, you would wish me uh, to do, and to look at uh, electronic signatures. Um, the electronic signature is, of course, useful in a whole variety of different ways, in that it enables you to sign something and if any change, even a missing dot, comma, a single letter is changed, the signature becomes invalid in relation to the whole document. So it's the kind of uh, technological approach that will give us certainty in future. Now, of course, lawyers are quite reasonably conservative, small c, conservative about adopting technology. Uh, it is very straightforward to describe the public key cryptography now uh, with the appellation of Rivest, uh, Shamir and Edelman, three American uh, mathematicians who developed the system that we generally use today. But in fact, it was done by GCHQ some years earlier, but kept secret. Um, it is uh, a system of uh, cryptography that you can describe in a single page but it takes a lifetime of study to understand that single page. It involves the multiplication of two very large prime numbers together and then a matrix transformation so that you can have one key for locking, for signing, and a different secret key uh, for unlocking. So you don't have to share keys with anyone. And that is the essence of a secure uh, system. The system is not new. Mary Queen of Scots used a system of that kind with a little casket she corresponded with her lovers. She had a key that she locked the lock, having put a message in it, sent the uh, casket to her lover who locked another lock with his own private key, sent it back to her. She unlocked her lock, sent it back to him. He unlocked the lock and at last he could access the key. So the key was never shared with anyone. And that's exactly how electronic signatures work today, except instead of the physical keys that are kept secret by the owners, we use electronic keys. And of course, prime numbers, as a mathematician, uh, are really particularly interesting things. And they actually come up time and time again. And some of this technology has been described in The Simpsons. Because The Simpsons the most of the team who write The Simpsons are actually mathematicians, uh, which may surprise you. 
And 18 years ago, uh, Homer Simpson, uh, in fact, made reference to Belfegger's uh, prime, which comes from uh, James Milton's Paradise Lost. Belfegger is one of the uh, seven princes of hell who's charged with helping people make ingenious inventions and discoveries. And Belfegger's prime number, and the reason it's attributed to him, is 31 digits long. I'll not give you them all. It's one followed by 13 zeros, followed by 666, which is why it's Belfegger, followed by 13 zeros, followed by one. And, of course, it's also symmetric. Same, you read it either way around. So prime numbers are exciting and interesting, as well as being useful uh, for electronic signatures. But I think for Scotland, there is an opportunity beyond what we're doing today. An opportunity, perhaps, to encourage registrars of Scotland to develop a secure repository based on this kind of technology that means you actually hold contracts there during the development and people access it in a secure way to sign, to annotate, to amend. That gives us security against the failure of companies so that contracts don't get lost over the years to come. It gives us security of control and access. Everybody's working off the same document. And it could, in future, give a significant commercial advantage. You're in your final Scots minute, Mr. Stevenson. It has been around for a very long time indeed. It stood the test of time. The Scots Law Commission has very usefully helped us take this forward to bring us up to the mark that some other jurisdictions have had. But I think the debates and discussions and the information we've had from witnesses in the committee show us that there is more that we can do. And I do hope that we take the opportunity uh, to do that, that we pick up the challenge of signatures, encryption in a secure way, because in mathematical terms, and you can look this up, this is an NP problem. Nobody knows how to solve it. Nobody yet has broken this kind of key. Nobody shows any sign of doing so. Presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call Richard Baker to be followed by John Mason. And if you uh, both take the seven minutes allocated, that will take us to the closing speeches. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has been uh, an interesting debate, perhaps a much more interesting debate than many of us had expected uh, when we first came into the chamber uh, this afternoon. And it's impossible to follow uh, or to compete with Stuart Stevenson's tales of transatlantic adventures, Da Vinci Code style mathematical problems and uh, indeed The Simpsons and that's been an interesting in the, uh, addition to the debate uh, today and uh, we always uh, enjoy Mr Stevenson's ability to, to spice up uh, debates of this uh, nature. So, uh, but it certainly has been uh, a, a pleasure as well to be a member of the committee and a part of the committee in taking forward uh, this bill uh, as uh, our consideration for the first time of a bill through our new uh, responsibilities. And uh, this bill um, has proved, I think, a good candidate to initiate that new role uh, because, as we've heard, there's been a great deal of consensus around this legislation. And while it's quite narrow uh, in its compass, it will have a beneficial eff effect for legal practice uh, in Scotland. And like others, including the, the Minister and the Convener, I'd like to take the opportunity to reflect on the fact that Dealing with bills brought forward by the Scottish Law Commission in this way will be beneficial generally to legislative reform in this Parliament. For too long, bills which have been the subject of considerable consultation and a great deal of work by the Commission weren't taken forward and they were left to gather dust. The Commission was left reliant on members coming forward to take up these bills individually, as my colleague uh, Bill Butler did successfully in last Parliament with the damages for wrongful death bill, which I'm sure the, um, the Minister will remember. But unfortunately, this was a relatively isolated example. Too many bills, which could have been equally as beneficial as this bill we're considering this afternoon, were not progressed on important issues. So it's good that in the parliamentary consideration of this bill by our committee, we can look forward to more progress with such legislation in the future. And can I join with others in uh, congratulating uh, the convener and the committee's clerks and uh, advisers on their stewardship of this process. I've perhaps not found as many moments of the uh, 
philosophy uh, and poetry in the committee's deliberations as Mike McKenzie has. I congratulate him on doing so. He clearly sees debate over the definition of quantities of corned beef in a different light um, to me. Uh, but I do think it's very much uh, uh, very important to recognise uh, the good work this committee does. He's right to say that it's uh, an opportunity to reflect on that. Uh, and I think in this process, the work of this committee will be very beneficial, not just to Parliament, but indeed to the quality of uh, law in Scotland. As others have said, the evidence we took on the bill was almost unanimous in its support for these proposals. And I took the opportunity during our deliberations to ask questions of witnesses on the issue of the potential for fraud, uh, which members have referred to this afternoon, and which the Faculty of Advocates uh, had expressed concerns about, particularly in their oral evidence, to the committee. But all other witnesses were clear that they did not see the proposed legislation as opening up a greater, a greater potential for fraud in transactions. As we, we heard from uh, witnesses, if individuals are determined to commit an act of fraud, they will find a way of doing so in relation to these transactions, whether this legislation is passed uh, or not. We haven't heard evidence of a higher number of examples of fraud or error in England since they allowed execution in counterpart and the electronic delivery of documents. And I think the issue is best summed up by those who said it will neither reduce nor increase the risk of fraud if we uh, proceed to pass uh, this bill. The other issue I pursued with witnesses when taking evidence on the bill was on the issue of pre-signed signature pages, uh, uh, because in relation to this area, there have been specific concerns raised about the potential for fraud. Uh, and uh, here there were concerns raised by witnesses, if not with the actual just legislation itself, uh, but with the whole concept of the use of pre-signed signature pages. Now, as the policy memorandum makes clear, the bill does not change the existing position in this respect, but neither does it prevent a pre-signed signature page being attached to a different document, provided that it can be shown that the party concerned clearly authorised or mandated this uh, in advance, or subsequently ratified what had been done with, with full knowledge of the content of the new document. Witnesses did describe some unease about the use of pre-signed signature pages in general. And when I asked Dr. Ross Anderson of the University of Glasgow, when he gave evidence to the committee about this issue, he said that as a solicitor, he would never use them. And that it seemed to him that the authorisation that has been given by the client in that situation is essentially a power of attorney to the solicitor to sign the document. And he found the use of pre-signed uh, signature pages uh, odd. But he also acknowledged that on this issue, the bill may be taking the approach it is simply to reflect some of the practices which are going on currently in England and to be facilitative for cases which may arise. And I think the committee has reached the right conclusion on this issue, given that this legislation is intended to aid flexibility for legal practice in Scotland. So we've concluded that while there may be misgivings about the use of pre-signed signature pages, and we recognise these misgivings, and, and we uh, mention them in our report, there also might be circumstances in which their use may be justified. Uh, Presiding officer, I think it would be wrong to overestimate the economic impact of this legislation for our legal services industry. But I do think this is beneficial legislation, even if it's narrow in its effect. I think it's right that we heed the advice of the Law Society that existing practice of signing contracts under Scots law is in need of updating. The Society informs us parties to a contract are switching to English contract law at a later stage because it's more convenient for the execution of contracts. And so if by passing this legislation we can ensure these contracts can in future be concluded under Scots law, then clearly this is beneficial for an important legal, service, legal services industry, and that is why it's right to support this bill today. Many thanks. And I now call John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as you'll notice, and the Chamber will notice, uh, I was not a member of the committee, and I think I'm one of the few backbenchers uh, speaking today uh, from uh, not having been very involved in this subject. So I have been spending some time this morning reading about it, and it had been suggested that it would be useful to have somebody from the Finance Committee uh, speaking on the, the subject, although I don't actually think uh, there's a huge amount of financial issues 
uh, on this bill. And it did strike me that we could have had somebody from the Education and Culture Committee speaking, or even from the Public Petitions Committee, or the Justice Committee, or the Health and Sport Committee, or one of the various other committees. It, however, it does seem to me clear that the process of signing documents has become somewhat outdated. And so I do very much welcome this move to improve the system for executing and delivering documents. I've often been part of one of those round-robin processes where one hard copy gets posted uh, to somebody for signature, they eventually uh, get it signed, possibly with a witness, it then gets returned to the firm of solicitors, uh, it then goes out to the second person for signature, and so the process goes on. Clearly, all of this takes a considerable amount of time, and we are all expecting things really to happen a little bit faster these days. And, and on that point, I would make the, the general point that uh, I think there are other areas of legal process uh, which could also do with a bit of modernisation. And I do very much welcome the fact that uh, a relative outsider is becoming the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and perhaps uh, he will come forward with uh, more proposals uh, about how to update and improve uh, the legal process. Because it does strike me that other professions and trades have to meet very tight deadlines nowadays. Uh, for example, auditors in my own profession uh, having to complete a company audit within a very sometimes short number of days. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, sometimes there's not perhaps a strong enough emphasis on the time deadlines uh, that there could be for court cases and other legal processes. Anyway, this bill is clearly a step in the right direction uh, in, in all of that uh, area. Now, I think there's actually two arguments uh, that most convince me of the need for the, uh, this legislation, looking at the committee's report. Uh, one of these is that Scots law is losing out, perhaps, to other jurisdictions, and the other one is, obviously, the potential cost savings, uh, including time, uh, of the updated uh, procedures. Now, to mention the second of these, uh, I suspect that we do have to accept that the potential cost savings uh, are estimates, and time will tell if they have been uh, a little bit over or under optimistic. Now, that's certainly a view that the Faculty of Advocates uh, seem to take at paragraph uh, 73, uh, where they talk about um, uh, most of the contracts uh, that are under Scots law are smaller scale uh, contracts which are not uh, in Glasgow, are made not in Glasgow, Edinburgh or Aberdeen, but in small towns <laughs> around Scotland. In such cases, we suspect that the saving of cost and the convenience that are envisaged as a result of the electronic execution and exchange of counterparts, instead of simply having people come into the office to do all that, will be limited. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Mike McKenzie. I just I thank the member for taking an intervention. I wonder if he feels that there may be some uh, help in meeting our climate change targets as a result of this legislation. Certainly, um, Mr. Uh, Stevenson's worldwide journeys, uh, you know, merely to sign contracts may not be necessary in the future. John Mason. Yes, well, I, th I certainly think if it cuts down air travel, that's very much to be welcomed. And uh, clearly, um, travelling anywhere takes time, even if it's locally and by car and so on. However, I have to say to him that I think one of the suggestions I noted in relation to this bill, that the less paper might be used, which I accept would also help the environment, is... Uh, in my opinion, is a little bit doubtful because throughout my working life, I have heard many suggestions that uh, there would be less paper used uh, in offices, and uh, sadly, I think that has not tended to be the case. And my suspicion is that if there are six people signing one of these documents, we will still end up with six copies, if not more, uh, of the same document, albeit a uh, slightly, well, not, hopefully not slightly different, but at least being signed uh, by different people. But I think the other argument that convinces me most that this is important uh, is the suggestion that Scots law is losing out or could be losing out, uh, while accepting that, of course, some parties, uh, parties to some contracts will always prefer to use the law of a larger jurisdiction, such as England or the United States. But I noted the evidence given by Todd's Murray in paragraphs 46 and 47, uh, which I thought were certainly uh, quite convincing for me. Uh, because uh, they said in paragraph 46 first, it has been suggested that the lack of a law and counterparts can cause damage to the reputation of Scots law internationally. Uh, and Todd Murray's written submission suggested that the existing Scots law, particularly the lack of counterpart execution as a valid form of execution, can cause problems in terms of transaction logistics and requirements, as well as giving a poor impression of Scots law 
and this is the bit that hit me, Scotland generally as a place in which to do business. Because although this may be one, only one small part uh, of what is happening in Scotland, uh, if there is the impression that Scottish business as a whole is not up to date and not efficient and not doing things in the best possible way, then I, for one, would be extremely concerned about that, uh, quite apart from the whole legal process. Uh, I think part of this, for me as a non-lawyer, is where is Scotland positioning herself in the global market? And of course, the legal system is not just another product like whiskey or cheese. It is much more than a product, but it is a product nonetheless. And if Scotland is to be out there competing on quality with, with the best food and the best drink and top of the range engineering and one of the cleanest environments in the world, then similarly, we want, what we, we want one of the best legal systems in the world. So from that perspective, I do not see today's debate as just being of narrow interest to the legal profession, but I think it has potentially a much wider economic impact. And if this parliament cannot fight the corner of Scots law, I don't know who can. Next, I note the committee's study of potential for fraud and error in paragraphs 106 and to 129. I was going to read some of that more extensively, but I think... Uh, well, I could I ask you to draw to a conclusion. That's now, great. Please. I'm happy to do that. Paragraph 110 points out that fraud and error can always occur. And I have to say, I've experienced that myself uh, some years ago when a rogue photocopier salesman forged my signature on an agreement to buy a new copier. It, but the minister in paragraph 111 notes that there is an existing risk, and I think that raises the question of how we deal with risk. I suspect there are parts of the legal profession that want no risk whatsoever, but I do not believe that is what we're aiming for. As in other areas of life, we want to manage risk and minimise risk, but we have to weigh up the practicalities and costs of reducing risk beyond a certain level. I'm afraid you really must close. And therefore, I will close. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches, and I call on John Scott Maximum. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking members for the quality of the debate this afternoon. It's clear that the Legal Writings Bill has achieved cross-party support across the Chamber, and I would like to reaffirm that the Scottish Conservatives are supportive of the general principles of this legislation at Stage 1. There are, however, three points that I, too, would like to address. And the first point is the potential benefits of the Legal Writings Bill to the business community, legal practitioners and those individuals who seek to use Scots law for transactional purposes. As we have heard in evidence, uh, and indeed from the Minister Fergus Ewing and Margaret Mitchell, there is uncertainty in Scots law at present as to whether execution in counterpart is permissible. This has acted as a deterrent for businesses and the legal profession. In addition, parties are often unable to undertake the time-consuming, impractical and costly signing ceremonies which are required currently. And further, it is unclear whether a traditional paper document can be delivered electronically. As a result, in many cases, the relevant parties have opted instead to use English or New York law to remove any doubt, which has been to the detriment of Scots law. This legislation will help to ensure that those who wish to operate under Scots law can do so by removing many obstacles and constraints. Although we must manage expectations regarding the potential increase in transactions under Scots law that may arise from this legislation, but evidence suggests that measures to put execution and counterpart on a statutory footing will give business and ordinary individuals the confidence to stop exporting contracts to English law and elsewhere that would otherwise be governed by Scots law. This is an extremely positive and welcome development. Turning now to the risk of fraud as raised by others and indeed raised by the Faculty of Advocates. And the Faculty commented that execution and counterpart could lead to different parties signing different versions of a document, either knowingly or unknowingly. Furthermore, the faculty expressed concern that parties will be able to exchange signature pages as opposed to counterparts in their entirety. Expanding on these concerns, Robert Howe, QC, explained, if one permits execution by the exchange of back pages of a contract, each signed by a particular party, plus the front page, it is all too easy for the rogue or fraudster to amend the critical stuff in the middle of the sandwich. Further, the faculty touched on the possibility that such a scenario could potentially lead to an increase in parties coming to court in order to resolve disagreements over the content of the documents. And for large transactions where millions of pounds are at stake, the potential for deception 
should not be ignored. However, along with my colleagues in the committee, on balance and based on the evidence we heard over a number of sessions, it would seem that the potential for fraud and error is no greater than that which already exists under the current system in Scotland and that in jurisdictions where execution by counterpart is commonplace, such as England and Wales, incidents of fraud are relatively few. Nevertheless, it's worthwhile bearing the faculty's concerns in mind as the bill moves through its various stages in Parliament. Lastly, I should, it should be pointed out that the bill does not include the SLC's recommendations that a central electronic repository should be established. However, this was broadly supported by witnesses during their evidence to the DPLR committee, and we felt that this concept should be explored further, always providing that adequate safeguards could be put in place and that the technology used would be suitable, adaptable and enduring. I therefore welcome the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism's update earlier this month, which indicated that the Keeper of the Registrars of Scotland has expressed interest in exploring the creation of an electronic repository for both the execution and the preservation of documents. And I understand that preliminary discussions between the Registrars of Scotland and the Scottish Government will be set in motion early next year, and we will await the outcome of these discussions with keen interest, particularly in relation to whether new legislation will be required to bring this initiative into effect, given the possibility that it will allow for the execution of documents as well as their preservation. Presiding officer, I would conclude by reiterating that this is a helpful piece of legislation that will benefit the business community in Scotland as well as the legal profession and individuals who seek to carry out transactions under Scots law, and that it is very much to be welcomed. And finally, could I also thank all those who gave evidence to our committee, and particularly all those who appeared before the committee, in particular the Scottish Law Commission. I would also like to thank our clerks as well, and I look forward to the bill becoming law. And as a footnote, I would commend Mike McKenzie, who managed to speak for the first four minutes of his speech without referring to the bill at all. Stuart Stevenson, beware. Your role as the Parliament's best filibuster may be under threat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I now call on Jenny Mara, up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. It's been an interesting and at times entertaining uh, debate this afternoon. I thank uh, members uh, for that. Presiding Officer, um, I have to say, um, when I noticed we were debating this this week, I, um, I realised that it, it might not be a widely popular or populated uh, debate. But then I remembered actually the importance of this because I have been lobbied on this very issue about electronic signatures by constituents who um, believe it is very central to, to their business to have, uh, to have this amendment made to Scots law, to make it easier for them to conclude contracts, to make it um, less costly for them to conclude contracts, and to make it easier for them to do business, to get more clients and to contribute to the economy of Scotland. And I think the fact that I have been lobbied on this in my short time in Parliament shows that actually the bill that we are considering today is, is very important for our business community and um, for our economy. Indeed, it was only a couple of weeks ago that I was speaking to a lawyer who was telling me um, that despite having concluded, um, having struck a deal uh, three weeks ago, he was waiting for the contract to be delivered from solicitor's office to the next solicitor's office, to the next solicitor's office, to make sure that all parties to that contract had signed up to the contract appropriately before they were able to actually set the deal in motion. This seems, in our fast-moving technological uh, world, to be a very slow process, and therefore I would congratulate the Minister today on bringing this bill forward uh, very neatly and, um, and bringing this process um, to a quicker conclusion. The issue came up about uh, climate change uh, this afternoon and um, 
I was very glad to hear that the, the, the flights uh, might be cut down on. I'm sure uh, Patrick Harvey and the new minister, Aileen MacLeod, will also uh, be glad of that in contributing to their climate change targets. I'm not, however, convinced uh, that the amount of paper in legal offices around this country will reduce. Anyone who has ever been uh, in front of a lawyer at a lawyer's desk and knows the amount of paperwork that they seem to, to have in their offices, um, I think maybe this is a challenge to uh, the legal community as well. Parliament is allowing them to go electronic, and uh, so they should. I was also... Um, half hoping this afternoon for um, a little lecture on Roman law from the minister. I know how learned he is in this matter. And as I read the bill and the, and the briefings on it, I was reminded of um, my interest in the whole concept of delivery, uh, delivery uh, in the legal sense, and the fact that uh, the, the Scots legal concept of delivery actually goes right the way back uh, to find its origins in Roman law, that the, um, the thing, the possession has to actually be delivered with the intention uh, to make uh, things happen. It's not simply a matter of handing things over. And therefore, I think it's very interesting that in uh, 2014, we are debating um, whether actually email or facsimile, which we don't even use anymore, um, if, if that actually constitutes this ancient cons legal concept of delivery. And there was still um, ambiguity in our law until this uh, bill came forward um, today. Yes, absolutely. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just to illustrate how cautious uh, professions can be, in 1881, the Bank of Scotland installed its first telephone five years after it was demonstrated, and the board took the decision on condition that the telephone not be used to conduct business. And I suspect some of that attitude is still around in our professions today. Jenny Mann. Well, indeed, I, I think that I think that that's uh, very true. If something's to be binding, it's to it's to, to definitely um, be on paper. But maybe the uh, maybe the minister will be able to explain the whole uh, ancient concept uh, far far better uh, than I can, presiding officer. But I think debate uh, today's debate has been um, very useful. Um, again, it it covers uh, the counterparts. Um, in, in contract, the counterpart signing, which I think is very important. It, it covers delivery in a very modern and up-to-date uh, sense. I think the um, tackling the barriers of inefficiency for business means that we can enter into contracts, work better together and improve the economic landscape of uh, Scotland. I'm very pleased that the committee um, is supportive of the general principles of the bill. I also congratulate the committee, the clerks and the convener on uh, taking through this bill. I wonder if some of the um, some of the questions that were raised during evidence, I wonder if the minister can indicate in his closing remarks this evening if the government is likely to bring forward amendments to address uh, these at stage at stage two. Um, I think it's a very good piece of legislation, uh, presiding officer. I think it will help business, and I've outlined, and I think we've all outlined some practical examples of that. I'm very pleased that there's consensus across this chamber, and I thank you for your time. Many thanks. And I now call on Fergus Ewing to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until five o'clock. Well, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And I, I cannot recall in 15 years there having been a debate in which there is such a marked absence of any significant controversy. Um, but that perhaps is a reflection of the fact that the Scottish Law Commission, uh, headed up by Paul Cullen, Lord Pentland and his staff, did an excellent job uh, prior to the legislation being submitted to this Parliament, but also a tribute to the work of the clerks, uh, uh, both of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee uh, and the Parliament as a whole, presiding officer, and the members of the committee convened ably by Nigel Don, who led the debate for the committee. And that solid hard work and application has produced, a, um, at stage one, a piece of legislation which appears to lack 
significant criticisms uh, so far as the conclusion of the committee is concerned. But I think I should accept an invitation from Jenny Mara to comment on some of the key questions. She is quite right in that. Although she is quite wrong that I am an authority in Roman law, my recollection is, despite the excellent tuition of the professors, learned professors and lecturers at Glasgow University, I only barely scraped a pass at that. So, uh, so it's taken several decades to confess that, but nonetheless, uh, better late than never. Uh, many members have asked, do you, do you think the suggested electronic document repository is helpful? I think John Scott alluded to this. This is an idea worth exploring. And following my appearance before the committee at stage one, I wrote to the keeper seeking a general update and a firmer time scale uh, by which she would be in a position to have preliminary discussions. And these should take place early next year. Of course, we have the books of council in session, as members will be aware, in which documents can be registered for preservation and execution, and that is a, a very useful facility available to Scots lawyers. Um, views on electronic signatures have been mooted, not least by Stuart Stevenson. I think the use of these signatures is still in early stages and that market conditions will effectively dictate whether or not more use is made in future. The bill does not restrict growth in this area. The benefits of the bill, it's difficult to be clear whether the benefits will be significant. But most members were, I think, confident that it was a valuable piece of legislation. Jenny Mara said she'd been lobbied on it. Margaret Mitchell gave some examples, I think, John Mason uh, as well. And plainly, there will be circumstances where Scots law can be used as a result of this bill, where at presently it may not be so used. Secondly, it may now cut down costs on travelling, uh, on meetings, and on the time that busy people have to spend. And therefore, I think it is foreseeable that that's the case. And I think Jenny Mara made reference to Dixon Minto and the, the evidence from Colin McNeill. Um, someone else made reference to the evidence from Todd Mitch Mitchell. I think it was fairly clear that it is likely and foreseeable that there will be financial benefits and benefits in time. Um, the area where I think we... Yes, of course Jenny I will. Mara. I thank the Minister for giving way. I was reflecting on this before the debate this afternoon. I wonder if the Minister sees if there might be an increase in business done in Scotland as a result of this bill, or simply that we'll be able to make existing business a bit easier? Minister. Well, I think a bit of both, actually. So, yet again, I'm happy to agree entirely with everything that Jenny Mara says. And I don't think I've ever uttered that sentence before in this, this place. Um, I think the, the serious issue, which I think John Scott quizzed me on quite rightly in the committee, was, was whether the evidence from the Faculty of Advocates signifying that the bill may lead to a greater propensity for the risk of fraud or error. And I think error was the greater likelihood, so far as they said. So we spent a considerable amount of time, and I spent a considerable amount of time with Scottish Government officials who provided some excellent uh, briefing material on this. And we concluded that the, the, the bill doesn't change the substantive law. Fraud exists. That is because there are criminals in the world. Uh, the bill is not, the problem is not unique to execution and counterpart. It has been uh, a practice in England used for decades to apparently no ill effect. Clients place their trust in solicitors, which tends to minimise the possibility of these things happening. And Professor Rennie made the point that uh, bills, uh, documents uh, since 1970 have been signed on the last page only. And therefore, for these reasons, I was persuaded, after looking very carefully at the evidence from the Faculty of Advocates, that this is not a risk. However, uh, just to pursue approach of belt and braces, always a sensible one for ministers to pursue, a presiding officer, I am writing, and I can inform members, I am writing to the Faculty of Advocates to ask if, in the light of reading the official report of this debate, they have any further comments to add, and I am going to copy my letter to the Lord Advocate and the President of the Law Society to boot. Um, References have been made to some of the lighter contributions in this debate, presiding officer, and in the short time available, perhaps I could turn to that. Uh, we had from Mr. Stevenson, not so much a speech, but a travelogue, a travelogue where, where he took us from Delaware to Norway throughout the globe, sustained by an improbable diet of overstrength corned beef. Uh, and we, he also uh, ensured that Mary, Queen of Scots, made an unexpected entree into the debate, something which was of sub-tangential relevance, equally equaled only by his reference to Homer Simpson. 
I certainly will. John Scott, uh, would the Minister accept that in Mr Stevenson's contribution, the one obvious and current um, element that was missing was the contribution of Turing to cryptography? Well, I'm sure we, you'll put that right in due course, because we know that Mr Stevenson is a sort of human equivalent to Google or Wikipedia. <laughs> the difference being that whilst we ask Google or Wikipedia for information, Mr Stevenson just provides it, whether we want it or not. <laughs> Um, Mr. McKenzie. Well, okay, yes, why not, Mr. Findlay? Neil Findlay. The only, the only difference is occasionally Wikipedia is correct. Ooh, Minister. Well, I'm not sure everybody would agree. I mean, Mr. Murphy, I, I don't know what the. This, this debate is fairly livening up, presiding officer. <laughs> um, Mr. McKenzie did really regale us with a terrific speech, which he himself admitted was wholly, wholly irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he stood up for the delegated powers and, uh, uh, and law reform committee. And, of course, his predecessor was, was the subordinate legislation committee. And I volunteered for that in 1999. And so boring were my contributions that one of the members of the committee actually resigned from this parliament to get away from me. <laughs> and the clerk left to further employment elsewhere. So, You've got 20 officer, seconds, Minister. In conclusion, could I say it was Donald Dewar who said that prior to devolution, that Scotland was at that time the only country in the world which had our own legal system, but which lacked a legislature. We're indebted to this parliament, to the work that everybody has done to reform our law, uh, where, where hitherto, prior to the reconvening of this parliament, that was something that we could not do for ourselves. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on stage one of the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business. There is only one question to be put as a result of today's business, and the question is that motion number 11664, in the name of Fergus Ewing, on the Legal Writings Counterpart and Delivery Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.